Today we will be in uh, John chapter 5. We're going to start in 16, but I, I want to just bring you back a little bit just in case you um, have forgotten. There's a man that has been sitting at the pool of uh, Bethesda, and he has been lame for a long time time, hasn't been in a synagogue in a long time, hasn't been welcomed in a temple in a long time. This guy is an outcast, and uh, he's waiting for a pool of water to move. And when that pool of water moves, if he gets in first, he could be healed. That's his hope. The only thing is, the guy can barely move. He's got maybe some use of his upper body, and it's not enough. Somebody beats him into the water. And we talked about this last week. Jesus asked a simple question. Do you want to be made whole? And immediately, this guy starts with all the excuses. And gang, listen, what has changed? We do the same thing. I ask people, hey, are you saved? And immediately they tell me, well, they're a good person. Uh, they've done good things. Whatever that is, kill it. Uh, you know, they give me all the lines. And then you say, well, yeah, okay, you know, but the Bible tells us that demons claim that they know God. So what are you telling me other than what demons are saying? Oh, you, you don't understand. You know, I know you guys are like in the church. You know, you got good lives, but I had a bad life. You know, I didn't know my mom. I didn't know my dad. I grew up in the foster care system. You know, we come up with excuses. God's asking the question, do you want to be made whole? Look, I know how this life has started. Maybe your life has been terrible. Maybe you have everything against you, you know. Do you want to be made whole? Well, you don't understand. I got a bad marriage. My husband keeps me down. My wife keeps me down. I, I, can't, I can't worship God because of the way they treat me. Do you want to be made whole? And the answer is, look to Jesus. The guy is made whole. The guy is made well. Jesus says, rise up, take up your bed and go. He goes immediately to the temple. Now the guys are saying, wait, isn't that that guy that hangs over there by the pool? And he's in here and he's walking around. Nah, I can't be him. It has to be another one. Are you that guy? Yeah, I'm that guy. Why are you walking around? Somebody told me to pick up my bed and walk. You're not allowed to carry your bed. It's a Sabbath. He can't heal you today. And again, the guy must be like, wait a minute. 36 years. You're telling me that this is not the day. Tomorrow, had to be tomorrow, had to wait another day. Hey, I don't think so. What's his name? I don't know. <laughs> Jesus finds him in a temple. Jesus tells him, sin no more, lest something even worse happens, which kind of makes our minds go, man, what did this guy do <laughs> that he should be in that condition? You know, sin no more. I think I'll be hanging out in the temple for the rest of my life. Hey, you guys want to hang out tonight? Nope. Don't watch what's on television? Nope. I ain't taking a chance to hang out at the pool again. I want to be made whole and I want to stay this way. And in Jesus Christ, you can. Now, Jesus ruffles a lot of feathers, but let me tell you something. He does it on purpose. Anybody that has the opinion that Jesus is just a nice guy that never upsets anybody, I'm going to tell you, you don't read scripture. Um... Jesus was sarcastic. At times he was rude. I mean, if you don't like somebody, how, how many times do you approach them and tell them that they're a cesspool of sin and they're headed for hell? No, right? I don't want confrontation. Read Matthew chapter 23. And look how Jesus treated the religious elect. He pulled no punches. Jesus didn't care about man, didn't care about being popular. He heals this man on the Sabbath for a reason. He's trying to get them to this point. What point? I want you to understand who I am. You've been reading scriptures about me forever. Since you were young boys, young girls listening. You read the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. But these are the scriptures, man, that they declare me. 
Those scriptures, that's what it's all about. It's about me, and I'm standing here in the flesh. Now, he doesn't say all those words at this point, but look where he takes them. Now, because this man being healed, and let's pray, let's pray, because this is a very, listen, this is a very deep portion of scripture. And you may have to listen to this teaching a few times. You may have to go to other pastors and listen to their teaching on this a few times so you can really see what Jesus is telling us in this portion. Remember, this portion of scripture, it's, it's written for the church, but it's really written to the Jews and for those that don't know Christ. Remember who he's addressing. He's addressing the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling party in Israel. So, Father, with that being said, Lord, we ask that you would bless. Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would give us understanding beyond our normal comprehension. Father, we're asking for your spirit. We love you so much, Jesus, and we thank you for this. This portion of Scripture is so important to our doctrine, to our way that we live, Lord. Let us keep it close to our hearts, Lord. Let us be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, because he healed on the Sabbath, it tells us, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and they they sought to kill him. You healed somebody? We'll kill you. Kind of backward thinking. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Now, Now I pause. The Jews turned the Sabbath into something burdensome, but God meant it to be a blessing. All they did was add regulations and restrictions to something that was beautiful. A day to just, man, focus on the Lord. Don't worry about your oxen. Don't worry about the the field. Don't worry about the rain. Worship the one that gives you all of those things. So, Jesus is not content with them just being upset that he broke Sabbath for them. Did he break any laws? No. Did he break the Sabbath laws according to God? No. According to man? Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't even allowed to spit. If a gnat went in his mouth, he sinned because he's eating on the Sabbath, something that was unclean. What are you talking about? I can't control that. We don't care. You sinned. You're defiled. Spit the gnat out, oh, you doubled down on your sin. It's a problem, man. Everything's a problem. Well, Jesus isn't content with just the Sabbath. He says, let's turn up the heat a little bit. Jesus says, my father's been working until now, and I have been working. And again, gang, God is always working. God had rest. We read about that in Genesis. The rest was broken when man sinned. Since that point in time, whenever that was, right, outside of our understanding, really, God has been at work. Why? Because there's an adversary looking to destroy everything. Oh, you have a nuke? Where's the button? Where's the button? Where's the button? He wants to destroy. He came to what? To steal, to kill, to destroy. That's his job. That's what he wants to accomplish. There is someone, God the Father, God the Son, and God his Holy Spirit, preventing that from happening. He wants you dead. Why are you still alive? Because God says so. God is still working. He says, the Father works. He's been working until now. And listen, he goes, and I've been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him. They wanted to kill him before. Now they really want to kill him. Why? Now, please don't miss this. Look what it says. Because not only uh, did he break the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father. And what's the implication? Making himself equal with God. Ask the Jehovah's Witnesses to give you an understanding of this verse. They can't do it. They can't do it. Why? Because the ones present knew what Jesus was saying. Right? Because we can clean this up a little bit in the English and say, well, he's not exactly saying. 
liberal scholarship today looks at this and goes, well, he's not exactly saying, but when they get to this verse and these verses, they go, yeah, it kind of seems like that's what he's saying. No, that's exactly what he's saying. He says, I am God. I am God standing in the flesh. He's not the Father. Please don't make that misunderstanding. God, Jesus Christ, is not the Father God. Jesus is the second in a triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit being the third part. Now, can we totally understand a trinity? No, not with these minds we can't. We, we can't think on a level like God can think, and I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. Because if I can figure out what God is doing, we have an issue, right? We have an issue. My father's been working until now, and now I've been working. Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him all the more. All the more. Why? You're making yourself equal with God. And again, what if God did take off? What if God did take a Sabbath rest? Could you imagine? Planes falling out of the air. The sun doesn't come up. Earthquakes for 24 straight hours. I mean, the entire world would be just in corruption and decay immediately. No, but God is on the throne, and God is keeping everything in perfect harmony, right? Not, not over sin, not over sin. We have, we have free will. But this ball of dirt that is spinning in orbit stays that way. And if you ask scientists, if you ask scientists, really ask scientists, how does this thing spin as fast as it does at the axis that it does and it doesn't just whirl off into outer space. Honestly, their answer would be, I don't know, because they don't know. They don't know. But they know that there's a pure science behind it. Well, what holds it in place? Uh, that we don't know. But we know exactly what day this will be and what day that will be. And we know that if we launch a rocket, what day it has to be on. And we know what day we can bring it in. Why? Because everything's exact. Everything is timed. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. God is so above science, but science is in every piece of everything that he does. I mean, just look at the trees. I, you look out that window, we got, we got sticks. Our guys took saws and they killed those things. They're sticks sticking in the dirt. That has no hope of ever being anything again until we look at it in six months. It'll be completely green, flowered, and over the building again. That's God. That's a tree. That's a little to, to, to weed. And there's so much exacting DNA in just that. And if you ever analyze the human eye and think that there's not some creator that is so far above anything that we can imagine. I mean, they build camera lenses just based on one eighth of the human eye. Some of the most incredible lenses. This thing can see in the dark, it can see in the light. It can see far away, it can see up close. What camera lens can do that unless you have to make all kinds of adjustments? The brain does it. And then scientists tell us, well, and actually the image is upside down. What? Yeah, you actually see upside down. It's the brain that turns it right side up. And then we take a shot to the head and we wonder why we have headaches and stuff. Right? We're fearfully, we're wonderfully made. And the one that created it all was standing right in their presence. And they want to kill him because you made yourself equal with God. Didn't you know I was coming? Jesus could say. Didn't you know I'd be here? Why weren't you expecting me? I mean, I gave you all the signs. I told you what to look for. Hey, can you put Micah 5.2 on the, on the screen? I'm going to tell you where I'm going to be born. And be so, because I don't want you to make any mistakes about it, I'm going to tell you it's in Ephratha. And, and you say, oh, what does that mean? He's telling you the county. And then he's telling you what town of Bethlehem is in that county for our understanding. It's going to be a baby born. It's going to be born to a virgin. Now, if you have to read anything past that and just not have mind-blownness, at that point, wait, a baby's going to be born to a virgin. Those two don't go together. 
Well, they, 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 they do with God. They do with God. And listen, and he's going to be from what? He's going to be from everlasting. That, that verse is so rich, I could do a whole hour on just that verse. He's from everlasting. Listen, he's of the ancient of days. The one that was there in the beginning. In the beginning, Elohim, the plural for God. I mean, right away, he's telling us about a triune Godhead. You know what? We, we sang about it. Let me, let me bring up Daniel chapter 9, verse 6. Would you, would you turn to Daniel 9, 6? Daniel 9, 6. Did I say Daniel? Why am I in? I'm doing my own personal study in Daniel right now. Forgive me. Isaiah 9, 6. Although Daniel 9, 6 would make a really good study right now, too. Now, understand something. These are the religious leaders. This is the Sanhedrin. These guys are in charge. These guys know scripture. They have it memorized. We got to look it up. They know it. Hey, do you know about that scripture there that Daniel wrote? You know, the prophet Daniel? Remember what he talked about? There'd be a child born unto us. They could recite it. They didn't have to look it up. They didn't carry scrolls around. They knew the word. For unto us a child is born. Listen, unto us a son is given. Heaven gave us the son. The only begotten of the father. He says, and the government will be upon his shoulder. The laws, the rules of the land, it'll be upon him. And his name will be called, listen, wonderful. Counselor, mighty God. They knew who this was speaking of. Everlasting Father. And at the same time, he'd be the Prince of Peace. If you don't believe in a Trinity, this verse makes absolutely no sense. Again, not trying to pick on Jehovah's Witnesses, but ask him to explain this verse to you. They have a meltdown. They will speak all kinds of gibberish, They'll have to look into a magazine and tell you, well, the Watchtower back in 1969 said this. I don't care what the Watchtower said in 1969. I'm asking you right now in 2022, what does this mean to you? How can he be everlasting father? How can that possibly be? And at the same time, he's the prince of peace. How can it be? How can he be mighty God? but he's also the prince. And he's a wonderful counselor. Well, there's a comma, so he's wonderful and counselor. Okay, well, if he's wonderful, anything he does is wonderful, right? So if he's a counselor, then he's a wonderful counselor. So it's one and the same. They were to look for this one. And in their last book of the Minor Prophets, Listen, they would come across Malachi where God says, hey, I'm going to send a herald. I'm going to send a forerunner. I'm going to send John the Baptist. The problem was they took 400 years. 400 years. Listen, 400 years, we're going to start doing our own thing. 400 years. Listen, if you had come in the first couple of years, okay, we'd have done it your way. But you weren't here. So we had to start coming up with, you know, a group of religious leaders called the Sanhedrin. And listen, we, we really mean well. We really want to do the right thing. You know, we're not, we're not like the Sadducees, man. Those guys are liberal, man, with the things that they're saying. They don't even believe in the prophets. At least we believe in the prophets. They'd make all kinds of excuses. And then listen, just over 400 years later, we have John the Baptist on the scene. No, they've never seen anybody like John the Baptist. And now they have Jesus in front of them. They persecuted John. Now they're persecuting Jesus. Back to John, please. Please understand that this is the central claim of Jesus Christ. And what's that? Equality with God. Equality with God. Therefore, they sought all the more to kill him. 
Verse 19, then Jesus answered and he said to them, most assuredly. Now, understand when Jesus says most assuredly, and I think there's like 20 most assuredly's in the book of John. There's three of them right here. But when he says most assuredly, that's a clue for us to say, you better pay attention to this, there'll be a test. You know what I mean? Remember your teacher, you say that? You better highlight this, this is going to be on the test. This will be on the test. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father, listen, loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. In other words, you're impressed right now. You're shocked right now. Wait till you see the things that the Father lets me do. Just wait. Hey, I'm going to raise a kid from the dead. I'm going to walk into a room with a couple of my disciples. I'm going to say Talitha Kumai and there's going to be a a little girl, he's going to say, little sweetheart, rise. I'm going to go to one of my high school buddies who's been dead for four days and he stinketh. And I'm going to tell him to rise. I'm going to tell people to take off the grave. You have, you have no idea what you're going to see. And, and listen, what Jesus is pointing to is going to become a day where you're going to crucify me. And when I have my victory... The graves of those who are right now in paradise will burst open and they'll begin to walk around. And again, one of the saddest things of my life is that there's not another two or three verses following that up. Like, Matthew, what the heck were you thinking? You just give us this one little, what, where did they go? They go knock on their parents' house, hey, I'm back. Right? What would they do? Go to the coffee shops? Oh, you have no idea what I saw down there. It was crazy. It's far out. And you know, the sad part, because they're going to die again. You know, what a bummer. You know, you, you died. You're in paradise. Abraham's bosom. You break out. You dust off the clothes. Hey, hey, I'm back, baby. <laughs> Dead again. Dead again. This is a select group of people, by the way. Yeah, the father continually works, and the son says he also works. He says here that the father loves the son. Now, when you, you study this originally, you know, you look at it and you, oh, loves, yeah, agape, I get it. But that's not what it says. It, it's, it's, it's a little strange. It says phileo. The father phileos the son. Philadelphia, right? City of brotherly love. It, it's, a, it's a bond, it's a love that you have for like a, a, a deep a friend. You know, a guy that you'd die for or a woman that you'd lay down your life for. And the father says, and not only do I love him, I really like him. I, I think Jesus is far out. It's just, it's a, it's a weird terminology to be using between father and son, at least that's how I feel. I expected to read agape, but you don't. Whatever he sees the Father do, that's what Jesus does. I'll show you greater works than these. Listen, and you will marvel. Your mind will be blown. Now, will their mind be blown? For some. For others, they want to kill him all the more. And they want to kill the guy that he rose from the dead because he had the audacity to rise from the dead. Must be Democrats. I don't know. Then Jesus answered, and he said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. Please get that. Please get that. What's the implication there, gang? That we should do nothing other than what we see Jesus do. We should act like Christ. We are to be Christ-like if we are to follow in like manner. You know, we're to rebuke 
We're to love. We're to work. We're to be faithful. We're to conquer in his name. Now Jesus will, he'll really lay it out for them. And I, and I love it. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. He hasn't done this yet, at least according to the scriptures that we have. Up until this point, Jesus hasn't risen anybody from the dead. Now, God in the Old Testament raised people from the dead. And understand that the Jews felt that the rising of the dead, that that was only, only God can do that. Only God can do that. In, in fact, let me, let me take you to a few places. Um, and I will put this on the screen. Deuteronomy 28 uh, and 12. Deuteronomy 28 and 12. Man, my fingers are beat up from working on stuff this week. Can't even turn pages in my Bible. It's sad. Yeah, I know it's on the screen. But it's not like reading it in my Bible. Look what it says here. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. It's a beautiful thing. It says, The Lord will open to you his good treasure in the heavens to give you rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. Now, the Jews believed that God had keys. Keys. And one of the keys that he had was the keys to heaven, where he can open up the heavens and allow rain. Why? Rain was life. Israel didn't have any lakes, right? They had, they had the med. They had no lakes, no interior water unless there was a spring. So they had to be dependent upon rain. And they knew that it was only God that sent that rain. So that was one of the keys. Um, a second key was in Genesis chapter 30, verse 22. And for the sake of time, I won't even go there, but God had a key to the womb of a woman that he would be able to give her life, a baby in her womb. That was expressly God's job, and he had a key for that. The third key um, is in Ezekiel chapter 37 in verse 13. And you know, I'm going to go there because uh, the, sur the surrounding verses are beautiful. I'll start in verse 12. It says, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I'm the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. Listen, and this is for us today as well. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place in you, in your own land, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it, says the Lord. I'm going to put my spirit in you. Listen, we were full of dead man's bones. We were just dead men, dead women, walking around in our sin, waiting on a day of judgment. And God stepped in. And we accepted his beautiful offer for salvation. And now he's put his spirit in us and we live. You may not know this, but if you're saved here today, you're not like the unsaved world. The unsaved world doesn't see things the way you see them. Doesn't comprehend things the way you comprehend them. Doesn't have the living God directing your path. Only Jesus can do that in the life of a believer. So now he says he has power to raise the dead. Now, I want you to understand, if you have a red-letter Bible, you don't see any black letters here. Jesus is surrounded by the Sanhedrin. Is Nicodemus here? Is Joseph of Arimathea listening? 
Listen, it, it's my crazy mind that believes that Paul, now Saul of, of Tarsus, I believe he's present. I believe he's present to listen to this. But nobody's saying a word. They're taking all this in. Why? Because they know the text. Because possibly somebody's mumbling in the crowd. This guy's from Nazareth. No, 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 no. Listen to me. They're saying that he was born in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Yeah. And you know the, you know the story that they say, man, Mary, she was a virgin. Joe wasn't with her. Wait, you're, you're, you're saying that this is possibly the Messiah? Listen, at the end of Jesus' life, there were many of the Sanhedrin, many of the rulers said, man, that was the Messiah, guys. I'm convinced. We got two of them that take him down from the cross, fully convinced, had given their lives to Jesus Christ, didn't care about what, what, you know, what issues were going to come their way. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And listen, I'm looking around a room to whom Jesus Christ willed life into you. He willed it into you. It was his choice, his decision. He chose you, but I, I thought I chose him. You did, but he chose you. I don't understand. None of us do. None of us do. Why? Because we don't even know how to choose the right color car, right? After you bought your car, you went, I should have bought the blue one. We don't know how to make choices. We make terrible choices. You, you get a drink, and you go, oh, I should have got the diet. You get a hamburger, oh, I should have got the chicken sandwich. I, I got this hamburger, I should have went vegan, said no one ever, <laughs> right? We don't, make, we don't know how to make choices. Now verse 22, another mind blower. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. We have this opinion that father God is in heaven stomping, looking who he can judge looking to see who he can just throw a hailstone on their head. Jesus says, no, the Father doesn't judge anyone. He left all the judgment to the Son. Well, how can that be? Because he is God. That's how that be. The one that you worship today is God. Listen, I know that, that you're like, well, that's very elementary. No, no, but some of you haven't gotten it yet. Some of you think that, you know, well, yeah, Jesus is like the manager, but the real boss is the father. You're missing the point. You're missing who Jesus is. No one has ever seen God at any time. What we see is Jesus. What we see is Jesus. God is spirit. You want to see God, the father? You must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. And listen, and when that happens, you go, well, I've worshiped in spirit and truth. Have you? Were you on your knees weeping? Because that's generally what it looks like. I've never seen anybody truly worship God and not be completely broken. Because there's something to worshiping him in spirit and in truth that you come to the reality of who he is and what's worse, the reality of who you are. And you come to the place and you go, I'm not worthy of this. God, how could you love me like this? God, how can I, how can I be in this place? You, you, almost feel, you almost feel guilty even worshiping him because you know who you are. And the mind blower, and he loves you anyway. And there's not a thing that you can do to ever stop him from loving you. Look, many of you are parents, if not just about all of us. What can your kid truly do when you say, that's it, I hate you forever. You're cut off. No, we love them. We love them. You know, we say, oh, they're the best. My kid's the best. You know they're not the best. But you say it anyway. They're the best. My kid's the best. I love my kid. He does everything right. You know you're a liar. <laughs> you want to beat that kid half the time, but you love him anyway. 
and you give him a pass. You see another kid do it, though? Oh, put that kid in jail. Put that kid as a bad kid. Not like my kid. My kid's good. Your kid was with him. Your kid was driving. No, he was held. They held him at gunpoint. He doesn't do that. Little Johnny doesn't do those kind of things. This is a perfect son. This is a perfect son who does the father's will. And you know, if, if you're a dad and you have a kid that does your will, you know how blessed you are. They take out the trash without you asking. They do the dishes without complaining. What's that like? What's that like? My daughter's not feeling well. She's watching from home. If I have to hear one more complaint while dishes are being done, man, and I love her, I love her. I bought her gloves. I said, here, buy your gloves. That's, that's, that's some grace I'm giving you. I bought you the best soap. Here's some mercy. Here. Got mercy and grace. Do the dishes. And now her brother helps her. Who loads, who unloads, who dries, who, you know. Here's the point. We're his kids, and the Father loves us, and we can never run anywhere to escape his love. Anywhere. Jesus wasn't going to these guys trying to condemn them. He's trying to convince them. Why? Because he loves them. He loves them. He loves that they're sincerely honest about what they believe. Now they just need to fix what they believe because you're putting more power into your laws then you're putting into my love and who I am. Our churches, our churches put more into our rules and our memberships than we do about following Jesus. And it's a shame. I'm going to be honest. I, I don't know how to pastor a church. I'm doing it out of obedience. What do I know how to do? I know how to point you to Jesus. Don't look to me for answers in a worldly sense. I don't even give them. My answer is normally, well, what does Scripture say? Can we do that? Can we do what Scripture says? You know, sometimes I, I sit at my desk studying and I go, God, why did you call me to this? You know, and I'm not, look, again, I tried to escape the calling. And I was miserable, absolutely miserable. It was like God locked me in a closet and wouldn't let me out. He didn't, but that's what it felt like. I was like, why won't you speak to me? Why won't you obey me? Oh. You know, it's one of those things. I didn't want to do this. And then it's like, man, just do my will. Just read my word and point people to me. That's all I need you to do. And I can do that. I can do that. Again, you know, when you get real with yourself and you start worshiping him, you say, this is the best plan you had? And, you know, you got to be honest. God, there's so many people that would do a better job in that pulpit. But this is where he's called me. I don't understand how these guys could have missed it. I don't understand how they missed it. My heart breaks for them. Because understand, yeah, they're hypocrites. But of the 613 laws, they really tried to keep every single one of them because they loved the Lord. And they thought by being good, because Scripture always said, hey, be good, that they would see God. And we've had that splash over for 2,000 years, right? Catholics. How do you get to heaven? You got to be good. Said the Bible nowhere. But yet, that's what we've been trained to think. Some Christians today, born again Christians, how do, how do you get to heaven? Well, you got to be a good person. I'm a horrible person. Just wait till I get tired at night. You don't want to be in my sin. Wait till I get hungry. Ooh. You go, that guy's horrible. Is he related to Attila the Hun? I mean. Thank God it's not because I'm good or nice or wonderful or sweet. It's because of what Jesus did for me. And that's what changes our lives. 
That's what gives us the hope and the joy that we have. I, 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 my, my kids are like, Dad, why do you like Christmas music? I like it because I hated it when I was a kid. My dad would play Christmas music. I, I, I had to leave the house. I didn't want it. I hated it. Now I hear Christmas, and it's like, Jesus. I see Jesus. And I'm like, how did you do this? How do you, like, reverse it? Anyway. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all, listen, should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Why this word honor? Well, we have the guest of honor, right? We use that term today. But in this day, the word honor, that was, that was big. That was big. You wanted to honor people. If someone, someone asked you to come to their home to dine with them, listen, you would honor them by showing up. You would honor them by letting the servant wash your feet before you entered into their home, going to their uh, triclinium, going to their table. Honor was a really, really big thing. Now the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they love Jehovah. But Jesus, that's just, a, that's just a God. It's his son. You know, Jesus is there doing some work. They pay Jesus no honor. No honor. <laughs> that they should honor the son just as they honor the father. All of these cults that claim to worship God but make Jesus less. If you read what Scripture says, what hope do they have of heaven? None. Because they deny the deity of Christ. You know, when I read scripture like this, again, my dad, saved on his deathbed, snatched from the grip of Jehovah's Witnesses. And God so had it that he created a pandemic so that my dad would be shut down and they couldn't get to him. A lot of bad things happened during that pandemic. For me, that's one of the great ones. He got saved on March 13th, 2020. Three days later, in Maryland, complete shutdown. And nobody could get in. My dad, he, he, always clean cut, right? Always shaved, clean shaved, man. And uh, just before he passed, like nine months later, man, he had a full beard. He looked like the dirtiest biker I'd ever seen. I was so proud. My dad was headed to hell. He was headed to hell. And by God's grace and his mercy, he allowed my dad enough cognitive power to hear, to listen, because they're different, to receive and to accept. Amazing. If you don't honor the son, you, no longer, you don't honor the father who sent them. We must all, listen, honor Jesus Christ. Or what we do is we listen to lies. And there's a lot of lies out there right now. I've never seen the name of Jesus slandered more than I have in our day. Cartoons are slandering his name. For the Jews, again, only, only God could raise the dead. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Most assuredly, I say to you, here it is again, another most assuredly. He who hears my word, listen, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Amen? 
That's us. That's us. We've passed from death to life. We've heard Jesus. We've accepted Jesus. It says that we won't come into judgment. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad about that. Because there's a whole bunch of things I would judge me on. But there's no more judgment. And there's no more condemnation. We won't be condemned. Why? There's no condemnation for those who are now in Christ Jesus. Gang, this is unbelievable news. This is why we celebrate his birth. This is why we look to Jesus in everything that we do. Because this is fantastic. This is fantastic news. I, I don't know what the Mormons will do. I don't know what these uh, cults will do. You know, universalists. Uh, the way international. Christian scientists. How many Hollywood actors do you have that are, that are Christian scientists? What, what, what are they going to do? They don't look to the sun. They don't receive what the sun says. They put God in this, this bubble. They call him an alien. Well, I guess he is because he is foreign to them, isn't he? Foreign to them. They have no clue what he is. I like that we've passed from judgment into life. No more judgment. No more death. Most assuredly, here it is again. I say to you, listen, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Speaking right here, listen gang, of the spiritually dead as were most of well, all of us, I guess. Um, some of you received Christ as a child. You don't even remember a time where you were spiritually dead. But there was a time where we were spiritually dead. And now we live. We're alive. We heard the voice of Jesus Christ to come, to receive. Listen, if you're not saved today, if you don't have this relationship with Jesus Christ, he's calling you right now. He's speaking to your heart right now and saying, come, come that you might live. I, I came to, to bring you life. I've accepted you. Would you receive me? And, and how many don't take him up on that? The dead will hear the voice of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life, listen, in himself. And has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because he is the Son of Man. Because he is the Son of Man. Because he has authority, because he has ownership, because he has the keys. In Revelation, he says, man, I hold the keys to death and to Hades. Jesus has authority over the grave. He has authority over the kingdom of darkness, over hell. Would you turn with me briefly to, uh, let's go to Daniel 7. Go to Daniel 7. We'll be here briefly. Up to now, Daniel is uh, prophesying of some pretty scary events. He's got these dreams and he has these visions and none of them seem really, really good. And we read them and they seem confusing. And, but then all of a sudden Daniel says, ah, there was a change. Something happened. And I was looking in the night, well, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions and behold, verse 13, chapter 7. And he says, and one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Listen to me. Daniel sees it. Behold, he comes in the clouds. Daniel sees Jesus Christ coming. He says, it was one like the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite term uh, about himself. It's 90 times, 90, 
91 times in the New Testament, the term son of man. See, here in Daniel, it's also in Ezekiel. It's always wonderful. One like the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. He's seeing a rapture. Listen, he came to the ancient of days. In other words, and he was the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel all of a sudden brings hope. He says, yeah, there's an antichrist. He is just blasphemous words. And he speaks. But then I saw one like the son of man of the ancient of days, the one who was there in the beginning. And he's here. And he's with us. And listen, for us, and he's here with us right now. It's beautiful. Back, back to uh, John chapter 5, and we'll finish up our study. Because he is, listen, the son of man. And it's pointing back to that Daniel verse. John wants us to make the connection. How is all this possible? Because he is the ancient of days. Because he is God. Now he tells us, do not marvel at this. Jesus said to those listening, don't marvel at this. And he wants us not to marvel at this. Not to be confused. Let's get our theology right. Let's understand what he, Jesus Christ is saying. He says to the Sanhedrin, he says to the religious leaders, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which, listen, all who are in the graves will hear his voice, listen, and come forth, and come forth. Now, this is a broad time span, and it spans two resurrections. You want to be in the first resurrection. You don't want to be in the second resurrection. But he says, listen, they'll come forth. Those who have done good, and what does that mean, good? Well, I thought good people don't go to heaven. They don't. But when you're saved, you do good works according to Scripture, according to the Lord, according to what Jesus has commanded. Again, why do you, why, why do you call me Lord, but you don't obey what I say? It's those who are obedient to the call of Christ, those who are obedient to his voice, those he considers good. For the good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. What does that mean in modern day, our language today for us? Are we going to be raised to the resurrection of the good or the evil? Well, listen, we're the church, we're the bride of Christ. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We don't have this. We're waiting the resurrection of our bodies once we die, right? But we, we, don't, we don't go to judgment. He had already told us that. That's the first resurrection, gang. The first resurrection. A, 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 an award ceremony, if you will. The Bema seat of judgment. But there are those that will be raised only to stand before a white throne judgment. And I know it sounds pretty, but it's not. It doesn't go anyplace good. Those are those that will be uh, condemned. He says, don't marvel at this. The, the hour's coming. Those who are in the graves will hear his voice. Again, Matthew says the graves opened up. They walked out. And why did they walk out? And how did they know? Well, remember, and I have to do this briefly, and I, I, I can't take you to the scriptures, but uh, maybe we'll kick off here next week. But uh, 
It said when Jesus died, he descended before he ascended. Keep that in mind, put that to the side. Now we think about the story that he told us. There was a rich man, we don't know his name. There was a poor man, his name was Lazarus. Jesus gives us a name. That means this isn't a parable. That means this is a true story. It's Luke chapter 16, if you've never read it, please read it. It brings a lot of insight. It says the rich man, um, well, the poor man died, and the rich man died shortly after. When the poor man died, he entered Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort, but it was a holding place. The rich man died, and that rich man ended up going to a place of torments, a place called Hades. The rich man's in torment, and he sees Abraham afar off, and he says, Father Abraham, please, could you send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue? I can't take the burning in this place. Again, not not word for word. Abraham says, man, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. I'd love to help you, but there's a great gulf fixed. And, And those that are there can't pass here. And those that are here can't pass there. All right? So you think about that. And just as a side note, then what the heck is a seance? All you're doing is calling up demons in a seance. But back we'll focus to what we're at. The poor man is comforted. The rich man in torments. Well, then would you send them over to my brothers and tell them to do anything they can do to avoid this place? Abraham says, listen, they have Moses who pointed to Jesus. They have the prophets who pointed to Jesus. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes... Even if someone goes, they won't listen. They won't even listen if someone rises from the dead. Now Jesus dies. When Jesus dies, he descends. Where does Jesus descend? To paradise. To paradise. And apparently gives some sort of a a Bible study on who he is exactly and what he came to do. And these were the first fruits. They were Ek Necron, born out from among the dead. These were the first. Again, I wish Matthew would have given us more. But Jesus is born out of that. He has power over death. Because he is the son of man. They'll hear his voice, listen, and they'll come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of the life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Again, he is speaking to Jewish leaders. Please understand, that's the context of this portion of Scripture. He's not speaking to the church, right? We're in Christ. We're in Christ. Jesus says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because... I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Implication, if we're doing our own will, we are rejecting Jesus Christ. If we're doing what seems right to us and not according to God's word, what God are we serving? There's a danger in this, gang. Not receiving Christ correctly, not walking with the Lord Jesus Christ correctly. He loved us. He's paid the price for us. He has has shown us the way. And again, as you continue to see, all we see is red letters. These guys don't say a word. They must be standing there totally in shock. They're going, is this the Messiah and we missed it? And somehow they were convinced This isn't the Messiah. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. 
Most of them believed that. Others, they looked deeper. They must have asked questions. And they became, listen, they became saints in the early church. I can't even imagine what that first century church was like. Can't even imagine. But it, it was a bunch of Jewish believers that have acknowledged Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. How beautiful. How beautiful. Gang, Jesus is here with us, before us, living in us, leading us, directing us. I don't know what God's will for my life is. Read the scripture. Do his will. You don't have to worry about anything else. What he has for you, you can't miss it. You understand? You don't have to worry about who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, what you're going to eat. Who starved to death last night? Nobody. How amazing. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The God that we serve, listen, was standing right in their midst and they refused to acknowledge. I don't know what your Christmas is looking like. I don't know if you're headed out of town or they're coming in. But you have an opportunity this week to show the love of Christ, to be the light of Christ, and to lead others who are lost to Jesus Christ. This is a very rare opportunity for, for the church. It's a rare opportunity for believers to point people to Jesus it's not just, you know, if you're just making about gift buying and, and look, and I, and I get it. You know, you're going to buy gifts. I get it. But you will be so stressed out and you'll totally miss what the point of why we celebrate it. But let's not get it caught up into the commercialism. Let's not get caught up with the YouTube morons that dude, Jesus really wasn't born on December 25th. Who cares? Who cares? God is so far outside of this time-space continuum. We pick a day, we celebrate the life. Why? Because it points others to Jesus. Do you understand? It points others to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your love. Your holiness, Lord. It's, it surrounds us everywhere, God. You're beautiful, Lord. We love how you love us, God. We love that you're always here for us. You never reject. When we blow it, we can call on your name. We thank you for our church. A church that was founded, Lord, in your name founded upon the rock that we see in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you please forgive us, Lord? Forgive us of our sins, Lord. We hate to carry the guilt, Lord, that we sometimes carry because we, we know better. We get caught up with this world. We get caught up with the nonsense, bad attitudes and the rest. Lord, forgive us. You died for so much more than that. You died, Lord, to make us so much better than that. We look to you, Christ. We have no place else to turn. Bless your people, Lord. Go before them. Give them visions, God. Give them dreams. Work out, Lord, your perfect will in their lives. We love you, Lord. And we thank you. And we thank you for the fellowship that will take place after this. Thank you for having a wonderful place that we can worship, that we can gather in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.